Yep, Manushri, we are live now. We can please start the session. Thank you. Hello, Namaste, and good afternoon. This is Manushri, and on behalf of Foroptom, I welcome you all to Foroptom e learning session. The Foroptom e learning session is an initiative by Foroptom, as you all know, and it is an interactive program where we discuss optometry topics. This session is live on YouTube, and if you have any queries, feel free to type them out in the conversation box, and we will be discussing them after the presentation. Today, we bring you back Mr. Kier Sabla, who will be speaking on the topic prevalence and theories of myopia progressing. Mr. Kier Sabla completed his Bachelor's of Optometry from Lotus College of Optometry in 2016, worked as a faculty in Wavikar I Institute, and is currently a fourth year student of PhD at University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he is working on toric multifocal contact lenses for myopia control under Dr. Andrew Pucker. So on behalf of our Optum team, I welcome you back, sir. Um, hi, Manashvi. Thank you so much for Four Optum team for having me back here. I'm always glad to help. And sorry for the technical glitches that I had before the start. So without much delay, let's get started. So prevalence of uh, myopia and the theories of myopia progression. It's relatively a short topic um, if you look at it just superficially, but there is a lot of detailed research work that is going on. And you can go on speaking for days if you have to, depending on what... Uh, different theories you're discussing and how in detail you want to get. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the prevalence, current prevalence of myopia and the future trends, uh, the theories of myopia progression, and some of the current advances or the thought processes that we have for um, battling or dealing with myopia progression in the field. Um, the main point, uh, the introduction of this whole point as last time would be that one out of every two individuals will have myopia by 2050, um, and one out of every 10 individuals on this planet will have high myopia. And that's why we should all care about myopia. And if you're an optometrist or starting to be an optometrist, you should learn this really well because this is going to be your bread and butter uh, probably in the future. <clears throat> and the objectives for today's talk is to understand who is at the risk of developing uh, this myopia and what do we think is causing myopia overall or what are the theories we think that the progression involves. So quickly, if you are a uh, fresher or do not remember what myopia is, then myopia or nearsightedness occurs when the rays of light parallel uh, that are parallel entering the eye or coming from infinity focus ahead of the retina, as you can see in the image over here. Um, when the accommodation is relaxed, then we say that the, the eye is myopic or has myopia. In this case, the distance vision is blurred and the near vision appears to be clear, most of the times due to uh, the focus. Um, so some of the treatments that are available out there currently are single vision spectacles, single vision contact lenses, and refractive error surgeries. Uh, this is just an overview, and you can read a lot more about this, but without wasting more time, the prevalence is what I'm going to be uh, speaking about next. So some of you, or if you, any one of you is a lot into research with myopia, then you would have seen this slide already, uh, wherein I already introduced my topic by saying by 2050, uh, half the world's population is expected to have myopia. And so on this graph, you can see that the green section, anything under the green section is people who have high myopia and anything under the orange line is people who have high myopia. And this is the number of people in billions on this um, left axis. And <clears throat> on the bottom, we have the decades as the years go by. And you can see in 2010, what was in 2020, uh, uh, 2000, 2010, 2020 is where we stand today, and they have projected a trend in the same rising manner to 20, all the way up to 2050. Uh, and this this is a grim picture to be posting. Uh, as if you've heard my myopia management talk on Foroptom, you would remember that I spoke about uh, how that just having myopia is not the problem, but the other causes. Uh, the other associated conditions that happen with myopia are the primary problem, and we and hence we should be concerned. 
So this is what the overall picture looks like or the world trends or the global trends. But let's uh, dive a little deeper uh, since this is a talk about my prevalence to understand what these um, individual countries or continents would look like. So on this map, you can see uh, a summary, a generalized summary of the studies done in a particular area um, as what is the condition, what was the condition in 2010 and what is the projected condition or uh, prevalence in 2050. So myopia uh, from 2010 to 2050. So in Western Europe, you can see it's from 28% to 56%. Uh, Central Europe, again, somewhat similar, and Eastern Europe, similar. So this is like, in most of Europe, you'll find 50% of myopia. East Asia, Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia, this already had a high prevalence of myopia, uh, 47, 50, 39, and would rise to 65, 66, 72. These are quite high numbers. Uh, so two out of every three individuals we are seeing over here will have myopia. Southern Africa um, had low prevalence of myopia, and it could be attributed to different uh, conditions just uh, for the sake of lack of data too. Uh, but we are we are expecting by 2050 it will be 30%, and the same um, goes for Latin America. Uh, we had little or less comparatively lower myopia in that part of the world, but by 2050 we are expecting it to be one out of every two individuals. And North America currently would stand around at 37%, I would say, from what I understand, and would rise all the way up to 60%. So these are the global trends, and you can see that this is not going to affect one particular country, continent, race, um, or you know, strata of geographical region. But it's affect. It's going to affect everyone. Uh, however, a thing to note over here is that it's affecting everyone differently. Um, as you can see, like South Africa will only have 30 percent, whereas uh, East Asia could have up to, all the way up to 65 percent. So it just it's a point to make over here. The point I have to make over here is that there is some genetic component that we have come to realize and accept that is affecting myopia progression, though it might not be all of it, but there is some component of genetics which is highly correlated with race um, that is affecting this this myopia prevalence um, at this rate in different parts of the world. So, um, I, I just noticed I have a typo on all my slides, myopia and from 2010. So just ignore that. Um, it's myopia from 2010 to 2050 by age over here. And you can see the dark black lines are what the number of myopia were, myops was in uh, two, uh, 2000. And you can see that the uh, prevalence of myopia, uh, the number of myops in 2050 is in the gray bars and uh, prevalence of myopia is switched for black line um, in 2050, whereas the prevalence of myopia in 2000 was the gray bars. So we can see that there is not much change initially, uh, like the younger age groups is almost similar. And some have argued that the older age group, we are seeing high prevalence because more people would be living then as the um, average life expectancy is increasing and we would have more and more people living out into these age groups and hence it's natural to see a little bit of increase in prevalence in that age group. Uh, however, in 2000, we see that the major age group that had the highest prevalence after growing from like five to nine years, 14 years, probably 15 to 19 years, the peak was um, the early adults or the young, uh, sorry, the young adults which is from 20 to say 30, 35 years of age. And by 2050, these young adults who are 20 years of age are expected to be pushed all the way or grow old enough to say 70 or 80 years of age. And we can see that the younger generation that will come in will all have high myopia or will have increasing amount, uh, increasing amount of myopia and hence the the bar kind of the graph kind of plateaus over here and tapers off towards the end uh, in terms of the gray bars because these will be the adults that we currently or in 2000 we measured as having myopia so that is why this 
decrease. Otherwise, you would see a straight line going forward for all the age groups. So you can see that this is going to be your biggest age group um, in the center that is from 20 years of age to say 70 years of age, all of them struggling or battling with myopia and other associated diseases or causes. And um, hence, and also one thing to note from this graph is that we can see that the trends start or myopia, um, we, see, we start seeing myopia in children somewhere between five to nine years of age. That is where it starts, picks up later on and plateaus at around the age of 20. And if you studied um, a lot of emetropization of the eye, then you probably know that this is around the age when most of those processes occur and refractive error can set in. So, Again, this is um, myopia and high myopia by age, but this is currently, and I think this is a study from Korea, South Korea particularly, and we can see over here that um, in the previous graph, we saw that thing, the increase in the prevalence of myopia, but over here, we can see that the increase in the prevalence of myopia versus high myopia is almost consistent. So the dark gray bars are, um, the myopes over here in different age groups in uh, South Korea and the uh, light gray bars or the shorter bars are the different age groups for high myopes. And we can see that in 19 to 29 years of age, um, as myopia is more in prevalence, uh, this the scale on the x uh, the y axis is in percent. So the myopia is more in prevalence around 75%. Um, so is High myope, high myope comparatively has higher prevalence. And as the individuals uh, with older age groups have less and less myopia, the percentage of people with high myopes also keeps dropping until the age of more than 70, where we have very few myopes, uh, very few myopes and relatively none in terms of high myopia. So this is the uh, prevalence by the age groups, and we can see that this correlation between how many people end up getting myopia and how many people end up getting high myopia is almost constant throughout the different ages. And as we progress, um, we hope that this remains same. We want the number of individuals with high myopes as they are at higher risk to be lower. But at the same time, this gives us an insight into how many people out of those, how many kids that we are seeing currently who are say five to nine years of age. And if they are starting to develop myopia, we know that out, one out of those 10 kids will progress into high myopia. And um, so keeping those in mind during practice and informing your patients helps us understand the importance of myopia um, control and uh, other techniques that we use to prevent progression of myopia. Um, also, I wanted to stress on the prevalence, which is um, urban versus rural. And um, this is one study from mainland China, which looked into the prevalence factors at uh, some of the urban locations that they have and some of the rural locations they have. Um, so in the urban, uh, urban locations, you can see that they looked for Hong Kong and Guangzhou uh, over here on the graph. Uh, the scale points, the circle dots, which has the most, or the it's the topmost line, uh, or has the highest prevalence, has primarily, um, is primarily from Hong Kong, which is a very urbanized population, and also Gonzalo, which is triangles, which is the second line. This is also an urban population, and you can see the prevalence of myopia in uh, Chinese children on the y-axis, and this is in percent. So almost by the age of 11, 50% of people, uh, of children in Hong Kong have myopia. And in Guangzhou, by the age of 14, as the data shows, we have around 70 plus percent of kids that have myopia. Uh, the next two are the Shuni M and Shuni F. This is uh, the M and F basically stand for male and female. The study reported it that way. Uh, and hence they, use the data, which you can see are the bottom two lines over here, which is squares and the crosses. And though the prevalence does rise to the age of 15, but we can see the onset is much slower. And even the total prevalence uh, as compared to Gonzao is much, much, much lower. And uh, the, as these are the semi-rural areas that they have. 
um, and the last is the rural area which is the yangtze area and we can see that the prevalence over there is also though it rises but it the the onset or the the high amount of prevalence is not there until um, six, 17 years of age. And as we've seen before, um, around 20 years of age, the increase in prevalence of myopia stabilizes. And so we hope that once these individuals grow older uh, with before reaching 80%, 90% prevalence in the population, most of them would stabilize in refractive errors. So <clears throat> this is what an urban or rural setting shows. And there's a lot of debate and argument in the field, whereas um, education and near work, et cetera, contribute to the increase in prevalence of myopia or not. And uh, some of those have been shown to not affect, and um, that can be studied later on more. But this is the whole gist as to how socioeconomic factors and education and the urban living might affect myopia. So some of the other factors that I won't be speaking about today, but you might also hear is uh, associate is uh, have been kind of classified as associated risk factors, and not everyone in the field would agree. But urban living also comes along with uh, increased socioeconomic status, uh, increased levels of education, and so this and um, pooling of genetic factors in a certain area uh, that lead to myopia. So that is why myopia prevalence, um, these can be called as associated risk factors and not direct risk factors. But yeah, the, the jury is out there to decide um, whether these are independent uh, risk factors or not. But yes, you would see a similar correlation as we saw in the rural versus urban population uh, in case of all of these points as well wherein socioeconomic status, the higher the socioeconomic status, the more the prevalence of myopia, the higher the level of education, primarily of parents, because we are looking at children currently, um, the more the prevalence of myopia. And genetic factors, um, again, it is us, the current percentage, the current odds are if one of, if none of the parents have myopia, then if you're considered to have a normal or zero odd of developing myopia, then if two parents, if one parent out of the two parents have uh, myopia, then you are considered to have uh, 2.5 times or two times the risk of developing myopia as compared to an individual or a child whose both parents don't have myopia. But if both parents of a child has, have myopia, then the genetic factors predict that the child is five times more likely to develop myopia. And these facts can also help you convince your uh, patients when you talk to them about myopia uh, progression and myopia control techniques. If both parents have myopia, you have these statistics to tell to your patients that this is important because their child is more likely to develop myopia. So uh, a lot of talk about myopia <coughs> prevalence and now I will dive into myopia progression. This of course has um, little clinical relevance as you will never be practicing this or preaching this to your patients unless and until they specifically want to know how the backdoor stuff works. But as an optometrist or an eye care practitioner, it is important that you understand what goes into planning or why a particular device or strategy or contact lens is working better or what is the mindset behind implementing all of these strategies. So before I dive into um, the details, since it's a highly research-oriented topic and some of these jargons, uh, a lot of you may not have come across and some of, <clears throat> some of these jargons might be confusing on how they are phrased. Uh, I would like to review certain points which are the ocular anatomy 101, just basic um, ocular structures that we'll speak about. What is accommodative response, lag of accommodation, hyperopic and myopic retinal defocus or refraction, this is basically hyperopia or myopia, but I want it to be a segue for peripheral defocus or refraction, peripheral hyperopic and myopic retinal defocus or refraction, and oblate versus prolate eye shapes. So um, on the ocular anatomy front, uh, we can all pull out books and remember all of the details that we learned, but what I really want to focus right now is the ciliary body over here and uh, the 
crystalline lens that the ciliary body is attached to because these will be important factors. Also a reminder that the uveal tissue, which is the iris, the ciliary body and the choroid is considered as one continuous tissue, even though they have different types of cells and different functions across the lens, but it can be considered as one single tissue. Um, and we will see later on in the theories as to how this really affects myopia progression. And uh, that is all for the anatomy that I really wanted to stress upon. Um, the next is accommodative response. Now we did study this at one point, but some of us have forgotten it as I did over the duration and I had to revisit it. So the response of accommodation by the eye when the eye changes fixation is a commutative response. So basically when you look from far to near or near to far, um, the response of accommodation changes because the stimulus to accommodation changes. You don't need to accommodate a lot for far, but you need to accommodate a lot for near. <clears throat> so that is the response of accommodation. Uh, and on this graph, you can see on the x-axis is the accommodative stimulus is how much accommodation um, is needed for that person to see clearly at what, whatever distance they are seeing. And on the y-axis is the accommodative response. And by zero, they mean the accommodative, there is no accommodative stimulus. So the person is ideally looking at infinity or uh, practically six meters or beyond. And then you go on increasing until 10 diopters of accommodative stimulus where the person would be actually looking at something that would be 10 centimeters away from their eyes. And accommodative responses, how much is the eye accommodating? And you can see that for a, quite some duration, say from one diopter to all the way up to six diopters, um, the accommodative response is quite linear or the straight line as the ideal line uh, is quite linear that the same amount of stimulus develops or causes the same amount of response. But as we go beyond that, uh, you can see that in section C of the graph that the accommodative stimulus is going on increasing, but the accommodative response doesn't increase so much. So it kind of trails behind. Uh, next is lack of accommodation. This is primarily the amount by which accommodative response of the eye is less than the dioptric stimulus. So in the previous graph, as we saw that um, this is a straight line, but after say six diopters, the, uh, in this case, after four diopters, uh, the accommodative response is dropping off. And of course, accommodative response will change uh, with age. So this difference between what ideally the individual should be responding as and what it actually, what that individual is actually responding is the lag of accommodation. So how much more accommodation that person needs or is falling behind of um, when in terms of accommodative stimulus being produced. So that is basically lag of accommodation. Over here, we can see that in the eye diagram that the focus is happening much behind of the phobia uh, because of lack of accommodation. Uh, however, do understand or realize that lag of accommodation doesn't mean that the individual is seeing blur or unclear. It's just how much accommodation they are lacking to clearly see that object at that point. Uh, hyperopia and myopia, uh, we know that in hyperopia, the focus is behind the retina. Uh, emetropia, the focus happens on the retina or the fovea centralis, as some like to call it. And in myopia, the focal point is ahead of the retina. What I really want everyone to remember going forward on this talk is myopia is focused ahead of the retina and hyperopia is focused behind the retina because this can get uh, very confusing once we get to peripheral refraction sometimes. So uh, peripheral hyperopic and myopic retinal defocus or refraction. Since um, this is a more research oriented term, some people prefer to call it refraction, uh, some people prefer to call it defocus. So in this case, we can see that the central rays of light are coming to focus on the retina itself. So ideally, if you were to just go by this previous definition, um, both of these individuals, if there are two individuals in this case, um, one with the red color and one with the blue, both of them should be metro according to our previous definition. But um, in the periphery that changes, in the periphery we see that 
one individual, the red one, the focus is forming ahead of the retina and which is called as a myopic defocus because the rays of light come to focus ahead of the retina. And the other individual, the blue one, the focus is forming behind the retina, which we can also call as the hyperopic defocus because the light comes to focus behind the retina in this case. Uh, again, there are multiple ways of measuring peripheral refraction. Uh, retinoscopy can also be done um, and there more and more techniques are being developed every day. One of the theory solely or prominently relies on this method to understand the progression. And so that is why it's important that we understand these differences to start with. So all this build up and uh, all this build up of different terms and terminologies. And so what are these elusive mysterious theories of myopia that I've been talking about going forward? Uh, one last thing to remember or understand is the prolate and oblate shape. Uh, so this is primarily the shape of the eye or the behind half part of the eye. So this is, as you can see in the diagram, it's a posterior eye wall contour, which basically means uh, closer to fovea or the back of the eye. This is what the contour of the eye would be. And the dark line is the posterior eye wall contour. Uh, do excuse the poor image, but I couldn't find a better, uh, a clearer image to explain this. Um, and the light or the white line is the spherical image shell. By spherical image shell, this they mean a projected image of where the image would form on the retina across the whole length rather than just the fovea. So if you are looking at peripheral refraction, where all this, this myopic or hyperopic defocus can be called the spherical image shell of these individuals. So in the first picture we see it's a prolate shape or it's long so the eye is much longer um, like in length and hence uh, the equator is much thinner but the length or the axial length is much longer and we can see over here that the posterior eye wall is much ahead of the spherical image shell and hence there is relative peripheral hyperopia so as over here in this diagram we saw the blue line which is hyperopia uh, in the hyperopic defocus in the periphery. And the same thing is happening over here in the first diagram. In the spherical shape or uh, spherical eye, um, rather in this case, uh, the, the shape of the eye across the equator and across the length, by equator I mean uh, around the ciliary muscles or the ciliary body, is spherical in nature and hence um, the image shell actually falls onto the posterior eye wall contour and hence we do not have two different lines over here for that. And the right one is the oblate shape or wide shape or relative peripheral myopia wherein you can see that the posterior eye wall contour is behind and the image shell is forming much ahead as we saw in this case the myopic defocus. So these are all the terms and before all of us forget what we spoke about and get confused even further, let me dive into the theories, which is all the crux about uh, today's topic. So there are two main theories, um, primarily for myopia progression. And one is the accumulative lag theory and the other is mechanical tension theory. And uh, these, these can be used to define almost all the myopia techniques all the myopia control techniques that we are using um, throughout, which includes ortho K or multifocal contact lenses, um, even things like the, uh, the pharma pharmacological interventions like atropine, uh, most of them um, can fall or be defined by the background as these theories. So the first one, accommodative lag theory is hyperopic retinal blur during your work caused by high lag of accommodation. So when what we know lag of accommodation is there is stimulus, but our eyes are not responding in the same amount. And so hyperopic retinal blur, which is we went over this, that hyperopic defocus or hyperopic retinal blur as in case of the prolate shape is happening because of high lag of accommodation. So there is stimulus, but the eye is not accommodating enough and hence um, the focus is happening a little bit behind the fovea. Of course, these images are exaggerated. It's not a centimeter behind the fovea, just a few 
microns behind the fovea and our eye is sensitive enough to detect those focuses uh, change in focuses um and then there is the mechanical tension theory the mechanical tension theory uh, there is a mechanical tension created by the ciliary body or the uh, crystalline lens which prohibits equatorial growth and causes axial elongation so by equatorial growth i mean the eye is not growing around the equator or the ciliary body and instead all that effort of equatorial growth or all that stimulus for equatorial growth is going towards the axial length elongation and the eye becomes more and more longer but thinner in sense it becomes more like a cylinder rather than a sphere um and so that is um the mechanical tension theory so the accommodative lag theory basically they found it out when they did the comet study wherein progressive addition lenses help slow myopia progression so pals or are um progressive lenses they help slow myopia progression but one of the things they also found out was that this only or this primarily help a lot in individuals who had high accommodative lag and so this uh, suits our theory but when they started doing this treatment for other individuals they realized that it does not work for everyone so if you have a low accommodative lag and even though you have myopia um, or progressive myopia this might not work for that individual that well also they noticed that this the effect was most in the first year of treatment and it died off as um, the person like as in second year or third year so they could keep wearing those lenses but it wouldn't be that effective um this theory also uh, is formed on the fact that uh, animal models respond very well to myopic defocus so basically the grow and stop signals so now this is again a lot heavy uh, segue into research but a lot of animal models say tree shrews chicks guinea pigs etc if you put my a myopic defocus or if you put uh, a minus lens in front of the eye when they are very young um their eye will grow grow until it reaches the amount of minus uh, myopia to correct for that minus lens uh, <clears throat> and if you remove that lens the eye would stop growing so there is like this grow and stop signal so if you could sorry if you put a plus lens in front of the eye the eye would grow myopic to compensate for the plus lens in front of that uh, eye so this is like a grow and stop signal wherein um you can stimulate whenever you want the eye to grow and you can stop as soon as the lens is removed it was also shown that you could remove the lens just for as short as 30 minutes or 1 hour of the day and the eye would stop growing so it's it's a little bit of segue into uh, when we ask kids to spend more time outdoors the idea is um that looking at things that are at a very far distance or at infinity ideally um it will prevent that grow signal from keep going further and it will stop them we do not really understand the human mechanics of this so we do not know what proteins cause this or what is the cell biology behind this all of this and geneticists are working around the clock to figure this out but it's a lot of work there are more than 3000 um 3000 genes that code this and so it's really hard to figure out the one that is causing this um uh, but yeah some day we will have those answers uh the next is the mechanical tension theory and in this the equatorial eye growth is restricted leading to accelerated axial growth so we already spoke about that and the lens can no longer thin or stretch uh by thin or stretch this is more to do with accommodation so and rather than just physical stretching or thinning uh of course physical stretching and thinning happens during accommodation but not like it's not being ripped apart or pulled but rather for accommodation and this causes myopia because there is growth and the lens cannot compensate be, with the help of accommodation or um, you know tonic accommodation and this causes myopia and hence the lag of accommodation so in the previous theory lag of accommodation was said to be the cause of hyperopic defocus and that led to myopia but in this um the ciliary tension causes causing restricted equatorial growth is leading to myopia and lag of accommodation is kind of like a side effect of the uh, whole thing rather than actually a causative factor 
uh, lag a company's myopia rather than precedes it, um, which is the onset of myopia. So myopia starts, and then you start seeing lag of accumulation. And we have some human data or human studies that strongly accompany this. One of the other issues or the point of contention between the mechanical tension theory and the lag of accommodation theory is that these animal models, of course, we do not have a lot of evidence. We cannot put uh, lenses in, and in front of an eye of a child who does not have myopia to try and see if the grow and stop signal works. That would be unethical. And uh, some of the argument is that these animal models or their eye shapes, the prolate versus oblate, doesn't translate well into human models because our eye shape is much different than most of the animal models used. Animal models that are used primarily have an oblate shape in the eye, uh, which for a lot of detailed reasons that I could go into and speak for hours works well, but humans in general have a more prolate shape uh, as compared to the animal models and hence it doesn't work. And so <clears throat> this lag of accommodation that accompanies will cause peripheral defocus and prolate shape. So it's a negative feedback loop wherein, uh, sorry, it's a positive feedback loop wherein the cycle will keep going and the eye will keep growing. Um, so I know this is a lot of words and very little diagrams, but research primarily is all about words and very little pictures. But I've tried to get these pictures to help us understand what is happening in terms of uh, leading to peripheral defocus here and prolate shape. So imagine this is an uncorrected myope. So the eye is longer at the center, you see myopia, and at the periphery, you see a hyperopic defocus or the image shell that we spoke about. Uh, this is a traditional correction. You give them glasses, uh, they are center or the fovea is corrected, and the periphery becomes hyperopic. And this is where the problem starts because now the periphery is hyperopic defocus. And since this is hyperopic defocus, the eye thinks, oh, I cannot see anything clearly in the periphery. Maybe I am too small and I need to grow and grow further. Now, one of the theories, the lag accommodation theory says um, that this is this all this is happening because of lag of accommodation. And the eye somehow detects this um, defocus, the hyperopic defocus, and it decides to grow. It's, it's thinking like, okay, I should grow so that I can see everything clearly. But as soon as that happens, the first, the first image of uncorrected myope is what really ends up happening because the eye will not grow focally or in one single area, but overall. And so your central image is now shifted and you have developed or it's progressive myopia. So your, in, your myopia has increased. And so you go to the optometrist and they will correct you. And uh, your central image again is shifted. Um, and the eye thinks, oh, okay, I'm too short, I need to grow. And so the eye will keep on growing actually in this. Um, what ideally needs to be done as put out by Prentice, uh, uh, I put out by Dr. Earl Smith as the Prentice uh, Award Lecture in 2010, is that we need to create an optimal correction or a myopic defocus in the periphery. This works both in case of, uh, sorry, am I audible still? Manasvi? Yes, sir, you are audible. Oh, thank you. So this uh, works in case of the periphery uh, wherein um, the, the focus, the peripheral defocus is ahead of the retina. So this is a myopic defocus. And when we correct someone with this kind of defocus, the eye, we somehow, we do not know how exactly, um, but there are different theories put out for it and we're still working on figuring out which one is it. Uh, the eye somehow thinks, oh, I think the focus is happening way ahead of where I am. So probably I'm already going on way too long. So I should stop growing at this point. If I keep growing further, I will just get more and more blur vision. And this is kind of the stop signal from the accommodative lag theory. And also it works out in sense of the um, mechanical tension theory, wherein the peripheral defocus is happening. And so this prolate shape of the eye, so as you can see, this eye is prolate in shape a little longer and it will prevent the growth of the eye or it will tell the eye that you have to stop growing because you're already seeing blur um, in the myopic defocus sense. We really do not know how the eye differentiates 
what is hyperopic defocus versus what is myopic defocus but there are mechanisms uh, for sure because in animal models we've seen time and again that we can create whatever kind of defocus we want some animal models are so flexible that you could fit half of a single eye like just the temporal half or the nasal half of a single eye with one type of correction and only the corresponding half of that corrected uh, correction will grow or uh, like into that shape and the other half of that eye would be as as it would have grown normally so yeah the eye does understand all of these so uh, what is the logic i just wanted to give a clinical segue into this so what is the logic of all of this so what we are what we end up doing overall is with orthokeratology lenses or uh, the multifocal lenses uh, it all focuses on creating a myopic uh, defocus so in orthokeratology you are kind of shaping the periphery as well as the center of the cornea and this causes a myopic defocus to form and the eye thinks oh maybe i have grown too uh, too much and i need to stop with case in case of um, multifocal lenses instead of reshaping the cornea we just provide the additional diopters on the periphery uh and that is the same logic again in te- in terms of atropine which is another one of the strong contenders for myopia correction what we are ending up doing is we are solving the lag of accommodation or we trying to solve the lag of accommodation uh and this tells the eye or it relaxes the crystalline lens and makes it a little more thinner and uh, stretches it um, probably pharmacologically and it probably tells the eye oh maybe i'm already seeing myopic defocus so i sh- should stop growing and uh, just stop right here so those are kind of the segways or this is where all of this leads into is according to these two theories it's attacking one way or the other or the thought process is like okay either it's a cumulative lag or the other way wherein we try and prevent this so i see in the chat um one of the questions that i'm getting is what about under correcting myopic eye does this work on stopping the progression um and that was the initial thought process and probably i would say about 15 years ago uh, we have developed a long way ahead of this um under correcting the myopic eye uh, is in case the image shell is similar to the uncorrected myopic eye over here as we can see very similar and uh, assuming you under correct by say 0.5 diopters in this case the the vision will not be significantly affected but under correcting the myopic eye doesn't create peripheral hyper peripheral myopic defocus which is what we need and this is getting a lot of detail into peripheral refraction the fovea is about say 2 to 3% uh, all of the fovea like Uh, the fovea centralis and all of that the whole area would be about 2 to 3% of the retina um though it is about 95 or 90% of our visual field not visual not visual field but that is where the visual stimulus primarily comes from and color vision and everything but physically in space it's a very very tiny area and we believe we don't know if this is to do with rods versus cones or it's just a fact of area and this is where the choroid comes in uh we believe that the thinning or the stretching of the eye is stimulated by the whole of the eye or the whole of the retina rather than just the fovea so when we undercorrect the fovea we definitely are providing myopic defocus at the fovea but the rest of the eye still be, still could be hyperopic defocus in nature and if that is the case the whole eye would be telling the fovea or maybe there is a war going on between the fovea and the periphery saying the periphery says i am bigger in area and if i say it is hyperopic defocus then so is the case and we are going to grow ahead and probably the fovea loses that battle and the eye keeps growing or um, it keeps progress the myopia keeps progressing and hence um in though initially for a really long time it was thought that this would help it might help in certain cases where the periphery is not so hyperopic in defocus uh, and hence you might have a very little percentage of success doing that technique but it cannot be a common form of myopia control because most of the cases will not work and um 
we haven't been able to segregate which cases work and which cases do not work. The current rationale is to find one treatment that could fit potentially most of the individuals and we won't have to worry about figuring out how all of these details happen before it's too late because we, don't, we are running out of time. So that is all about peripheral refraction. So some of the current advances that are that are somehow still targeting all of these or the effects of all of the, these both theories um, are one thing, the first thing is sunlight. Uh, we think for a really long time, about a decade or so, we thought sunlight prevents myopia progression and hence kids should spend time outdoor in sunlight. Um, but recent, recent evidence has shown that sun, exposure to sunlight early on in um, a child's growth prevents onset of myopia. So they will not get myopia in the first place. But once they do get myopia, if you see a child come in with half a diopter or one diopter, we are not really confident as a research group or research community that it prevents progression so much. Um, the other is blue versus red light focus. And this I think was, uh, this I think came into focus once we started using a lot of screens and the argument was perhaps this blue light emitting screens are causing all of these problems. And the rationale or the theory behind it is that the focus, the red light or the shorter, uh, the longer wavelengths form a focus, a different chromatic focus as compared to the blue light. And um, Recently, we have also learned that our uh, ret photo photoreceptors are able to detect where the focus is forming in those few nanometers of difference as well. So the thought process is if kids were to grow, and of course, this is not practically possible as of yet, but it's still uh, an animal model study, wherein if animals are grown in blue light versus red light, um, one will have more, uh, one will, have, will, will be able to develop myopia and the other won't be able to develop myopia because of the focus of the light. And uh, there have been some preliminary um, strong outcomes wherein up to one diopter of progression can be prevented. But the problem is that the progression only limits to one diopter and we know if myopia is progressing, then it will go on progressing to like two, three, four, et cetera. So you can have a one diopter difference if you grow animals in, or if you allow animals to grow in blue versus red light, but not much more. Uh, seven, methyl xanthine. There was some initial interest. I don't know the current state of this compound. Seven methyl xanthine is a compound found in coffee primarily. And there was some initial interest as to this pharmacologically could somehow inhibit axial length uh, growth. So it somehow is preventing choroid thinning, I believe. And it is letting the eye to be more myopic defocus rather than hyperopic defocus that way. Um, the outdoor near focus field of view theory. Uh, this is again something I just learned this um, this spring or January, February. I think uh, we had Ian Flitcroft. Um, I think he is in Ireland and he came to give us a lecture and he spoke about how even though looking at infinity uh, for an hour or, you know, like sometimes some, I have seen some practitioners be like, okay, if you have to look at distance for the stop signal to activate, you should look at say 20 meters, um, uh, like the 20, 20, 20 rule, which we use for dry eyes, look at 20 meters every 20 minutes for 20 seconds. And this would probably um, activate the stop signal. And if it activates the stop signal, then students uh, uh, will not have, will develop, will not develop myopia or, you know, have slower, slower myopia progression. And um, this was also somehow shown with, uh, with certain schools. I think they did a study wherein kids sitting next to the window, um, they were lesser likely somehow to develop myopia as compared to kids sitting away from the window or in classrooms that had no windows whatsoever. Uh, again, it plays a lot into classrooms that have no windows will have more blue light, et cetera. So we don't really know which one it is, but the field of view theory is that even if you're sitting, say, one meter away from the window, and the window is not like this huge expanse covering your whole wall, but a decent sized window. And if you look away for, say, 20 seconds every 20 minutes, or even sitting at your desk, you look at outside the window, even for an hour at a stretch, it is unlikely to prevent myopia progression, uh, just because 
your field of view, a very short section or your fovea is being stimulated primarily uh, with distance or inf vision from infinity, but the periphery is still near. So the walls around that window are still <clears throat> giving you a near focus and the eye thinks that uh, this is a near focus and hence it is causing, um, hence it thinks that, okay, I need to grow further and further. Uh, so that is one other thing. Uh, genetics, yes, as I already spoke, there are more than 3000 genes, I believe, and we're trying to eliminate some of them as soon as possible, trying to look at the most important ones we think should affect all of this. Uh, once we figure that out, maybe if we have ways to manipulate it, we'll be able to treat it better. If not, at least we will understand the process inside the eye that is happening to cause myopia progression and might be able might be we will be able to develop drugs to prevent that from happening. However, um, it's, a, it's a very growing field of um, myopia research, but at the same time, doesn't have any conclusive theories at this point. Scleral cross-linking is another one, and it is more to deal with the effect rather than the cause itself. So atropine, ortho K, multifocals kind of work on the cause, but scleral cross-linking, um, Dr. Raphael Gritz at our university itself, uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham, is studying uh, scleral cross-linking. So just like some of us have heard about the corneal cross-linking, especially in case of keratoconus, where you can uh, cross-link the cornea to improve its strength and prevent the ectasia of the cornea. Uh, and we all know that sclera and cornea are both made from collagen, just a different type and probably different structural arrangements because cornea is clear because of its uh, collagen structural arrangement. So what if, if we could cross-link the sclera the same way we cross-link the cornea? If cornea can be stopped from growing or like slowed down from growing, can cross-linking the cornea uh, the sclera too prevent the eye from growing or elongating? Uh, there has been some animal model success. Of course, this would be an extreme case here, extreme case treatment. It wouldn't be, oh, I'm having like, I have 0.25 or 0.5 diopters of myopia, I should do scleral cross-linking. No, because it would be a surgery uh, wherein you would inject stuff, inject certain uh, chemical agents or pharmacological agents into the eye. And so if the, this would be an extreme case, method when and if someone has eight diopters of myopia and is still progressing, then we would want to go for this before they end up to like 20 diopters of myopia or something. But yeah, it has just been being used on animal models and uh, I'm not sure of the most recent advances, but yeah, this is also something in the current advances that we are looking at. And do excuse the reference on this slide. Um, this is not the reference for the slide. These are just something I have learned or read over the years. And with that being said, I think I've spoken about the two major theories. Uh, we spoke about the prevalence of myopia and how it's going to affect all of our practices and the world in general, and some of the most current advances <coughs> to, uh, in terms of using these theories to prevent myopia progression. And I guess uh, I have a few resources. So one is subscribe for Power Optom because that's a great learning platform and you can learn more about myopia on this platform. Um, and the other is if you're, detail, if you're interested in the detailed research, um, the International Myopia Institute uh, has white papers. I believe there are seven or eight of them, each referring to a different topic completely, starting from definition of myopia all the way to clinical practices and industry, industry um, uh, industry recommendations, et cetera, uh, to develop new re new products. Uh, so yeah, th there's a lot to learn from those white papers too. Um, so those are some of the resources I have. With that, I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Andrew Bucker, the four Optom team for this opportunity and UAB School of Optometry for all of this valuable time and learning that I'm doing over here. And thank you. And following this, I will take any questions anyone has. Hopefully it wasn't too bonkers and someone understood something about myopia theories. Of course, we did a lot of things about myopia and that was a wonderful session, of course, as usual. And I'm sure that our audiences have immensely enjoyed it. Uh, so we're open for questions if we have any.
but I think you've covered the question that was asked in the middle. So I think we can uh, effectively say that we're done with the questions now. So on behalf of the Optum team and our audience, I would like to thank Mr. Kiyur for giving us your time and sharing the knowledge with us. And I would also like to thank our audience for being so supportive, interactive and attentive as usual. I have a notice here. We have a panel discussion on 19th of July, 2020, which is tomorrow on career in corporate optometry at 5 p.m. IST. So make sure you catch it, 5 p.m. IST. Meanwhile, Please like your video, like the video, subscribe to our channel, and you can also visit us as at www.foroptom.com. Also follow us on social media. This is your host Manashree signing off. Stay safe, stay home, have a good day. Thank you. Are we off here?